Last November, I ordered a CNC router to use in my garage. I had been eyeing them up ever since we got one at work, and I found out how reasonably priced they were for what they could offer. For a Black Friday deal, Carbide3D was offering their Shapeoko CNC machines with a free router and free shipping, which saved me a couple hundred dollars off of what I normally pay, so I made the investment on a Shapeoko 3XL, which has a max cutting area of 33 inches by 17 inches by 3 inches. I wanted something long enough that I could cut bow risers if I wanted. CNC routers like this are made for repeatedly cutting wood, plastics, and soft metals. For wood, they can be used as a small-scale production machine, but for metal, they're really only designed for hobby use at best. A production-level CNC for metal cutting will be much heavier, much more rigid, have more power, and be much more expensive, but it can hog out material much faster. Since my CNC router is less rigid, I have to baby the material removal rate to prevent major issues. The machine cost $1,500 to my door. The smaller platform would have only cost $1,000, and the largest closer to $2,000. By the time I purchased an array of end mills, work holding glues, tapes, and vices, built a table, and added a dedicated Windows tablet, I was closer to $2,000 all said and done. It's a lot of money to drop on a power tool, but you have to remember that it's capable of doing the work of multiple power tools that would take up a lot more floor space combined. The machine came in a box with assembly instructions. It took a few hours to put everything together, but it was fairly straightforward. The hardest part for me was routing all the wiring through the drag chains. The free router that came with my CNC is a DeWalt 611. They also had a Makita option, and you can choose to purchase just the CNC and buy an aftermarket spindle if you want. The main differences will be RPM range, horsepower, and runout, which is how true the end mill rotates on its axis. The routers tend to be high RPM, which makes them better suited for woods and plastics. Metals are usually cut at lower RPM, but with a smaller diameter end mill, you can sometimes achieve a satisfactory surface cutting speed at a higher RPM. The CNC plugs into a standard wall outlet, as does the router. The CNC doesn't communicate with the router, so you have to turn it on and off and adjust the speed manually when you run a program. The CNC does communicate with my Windows tablet through a USB cord. The tablet runs a program called Carbide Motion, which loads and runs the programs and allows the machine to jog and set machining origins. In order to create a program to run, you need to use a CAM software. CAM stands for Computer Aided Manufacturing. Carbide 3D does offer a free CAM software called Carbide Create. It allows you to load image files such as an SVG or a DXF and cut them out. It also allows you to carve fancy letters and designs with V-bits. Overall though, it's a pretty simple and limited program. Generally, I use Fusion 360, which is free to use for hobbyists. Large businesses would need to pay to use it. What I like about Fusion 360 is that I can load 3D files and have a ton of leeway in terms of how I want to cut it. All of the settings can be completely overwhelming for somebody new to CAM. The YouTube channel NYCCNC has some great intro videos on how to use it. How do I get the 3D files? I use a free software called Onshape. Like SolidWorks or AutoCAD, it's a powerful 3D CAD software. CAD stands for Computer Aided Design. There are quite a few tutorials on YouTube, and this software is also free as long as your files are made public. To store private files, you need to pay for it. So basically, my workflow can go a couple of ways. For a 2D cutout, I can create a shape in either Adobe Illustrator, Photoshop, Onshape, or something similar, export an SVG file, and load it into either Fusion 360 or Carbide Create. Then, I input the cutting settings, export the G-code file, load it into Carbide Motion, and run the program. For a 3D shape, I need to use Onshape to create the part, export as a step file, load into Fusion 360, set the parameters, export the G-code, load into Carbide Motion, and run the program. For a V-carving file, I create a shape or text in Adobe Illustrator or something similar, export the SVG file, load it into Carbide Create, and create a V-carving profile. There are more in-depth tutorials on the internet on how to do that. After the V-carving profile is created, I can upload it into Carbide Motion and run the program. You notice that I keep saying set the parameters. Well, what parameters? How do you know what to set? This is probably the biggest learning curve for somebody without a machining background to overcome. When cutting soft woods, you can really get away with a lot, and the default outputs from Carbide Create will get you close enough. But when cutting metal, it's a huge deal. You can screw up your machine or send pieces of metal flying at high speeds across the room just by choosing the wrong settings. The idea is that each material has a recommended surface cutting speed and chip load. You would select an appropriate end mill length, material, 
number of flutes, appropriate spindle RPM, appropriate feed rate, depth of cut, and width of cut to make sure you're at the right surface speed and chip load. Those settings are often known as feeds and speeds. It can be problematic going either too fast or too slow. The CNC Cookbook website has great articles and explains the basics. The problem is many of the free online calculators I started out trying gave me feeds and speeds that were intended for heavier, more rigid machines that were too aggressive for my Shape Oco. I ended up doing a 30-day free trial of the G-Wizard software and purchasing it afterwards because of the speed and peace of mind that I have when cutting aluminum. Even after getting the software, it took a bit of trial and error figuring out how much I needed to dial back the horsepower and material removal rate to keep my machine cutting smoothly and chatter free. For cutters, you have flat end mills, ball end mills, and V-bits. There are others, but those are the main categories. Flat end mills are great for roughing out large areas of materials and doing 2D cuts. Ball end mills are good at smoothing 3D contours, and V-bits are generally used for engraving. A typical 3D shape would usually start with a large flat end mill to rough out most of the material, and then switch to a ball end mill to remove the steps and achieve a fine finish. End mills can have different numbers of flutes, different materials, lengths, and coatings depending on what you're trying to do. Another important learning curve for me was work holding. If you can't hold your raw material still on the machining platform, you won't get good cuts and can ruin your part. When cutting wood, I find that double-sided carpet tape or hot glue works well. For aluminum, that's usually not enough. I tried machining wax, but found it hard to squish it flat enough to get my part square to the end mill. And with either tape, wax, or hot glue, I'd occasionally have the part pop loose during the machining job, and I would need to quickly stop the program before the part would start rattling around violently with the end mill, potentially breaking the cutter or the machine. What I found is that the best possible work holding method is one that allows me to bolt the part onto the wasteboard. I installed some threaded inserts into the back side of my MDF wasteboard and reinforced them with epoxy. That allowed me to bolt a drill press vise onto the wasteboard, which provides a much better hold. When using the vise, I can't machine the outer edge of the part. And when I've needed to do that, I've generally found a way to design my parts such that they include quarter inch holes that I can use to bolt the part directly to the table. Since I've started doing this, I haven't had any aluminum parts pop loose during machining. If you look at production metal cutting machines, they're generally run with coolant. Using the proper settings, much of the heat generated will be carried away with the chips that fly out of the part. The main purpose that the coolant serves is to clear the chips away from the cut. When chips clog the path of an end mill, they can be recut, which is really bad for tool life. It can even cause tool breakage. I tried WD-40 as a lubricant, which is somewhat commonly used for aluminum. It did a couple of things. Number one, it soaked into my MDF wasteboard and now double-sided tape won't stick to it. And secondly, it made the chips heavier so that they just sort of collect instead of being carried away. Since I've stopped using WD-40 as a coolant and cutting dry, I actually get better chip removal because the air coming from the router blows most of the chips out of the way before the end mill can recut them. I also haven't broken or welded any of my uncoated carbide cutters, nor do I experience any chatter. It's possible that I'll get slightly reduced tool life this way, but so far the benefits outweigh the consequences. The main purpose for me buying this router was to cut out parts for traditional bows and miscellaneous metal accessories. I've cut Christmas ornaments, signs, tree steps, platform posts. I've actually machined and sold enough of the posts to cover a lot of the initial cost of the machine. I don't intend on manufacturing anything out of my garage long term, but I figured if I can recoup the cost of the machine, then I basically have a free machine to do whatever I want with. If you're interested in learning more about these desktop CNC machines, I recommend you check out Winston Moy's channel on YouTube. Thanks for watching.